you very much for joining. I'm Sean Jabobo Lapali, I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at Tulane University. And then my co chair is Augie Size, who's an orthopedic trauma surgeon at UC Davis. And thank you very much for joining us tonight for our drawing club on geriatric pelvic ring disruptions. And we're very lucky to have this esteemed group of moderators, as well as our faculty of elders in second. We have Stephen Scheiman, who's joining us from UCLA Harbor. We have Patrick Kellum from the University of Texas at Houston. And then we have David Zulzer from the University of Kentucky. And we have Dr. Chip Rout, who is well known to most of everybody, who's coming from the University of Texas. And also we have Dr. Joshua Perry from the University of Colorado and Denver Health as our authors who are gonna be participating in our interviews as well as our chat and discussion. A couple of housekeeping uh, points. These are all disclosures for the associated moderators and um, participants. Disclosures for AO North America. And importantly, please throughout the session, please mute your microphones unless you are intending to speak at that moment. Um, keep your video cameras off to avoid any unnecessary distractions. Dr. Size will be monitoring the Q&A box and we'll be answering questions in real time or we'll save them for an in-person Q&A session as appropriate. And the, we also do have a chat box for faculty and staff, so please make sure that you use a Q&A box for any of your questions that you would like answered. Here's our agenda for the evening. Uh, our first presentation is going to be by Dr. Zulzer, talking about a paper with Dr. Hoffman. And then after that, we have two video interviews. The first one with Dr. Scheiman and Dr. Perry on his paper on fractures and inability to mobilize after a cold lateral compression pelvic ring injuries with dynamic instability. And then our second video, Dr. Callum and Dr. Rout, does operative treatment of geriatric pelvic injuries lead to higher risk of one-year mortality? And after that, we want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. We please encourage everyone to either both put your questions in the chat or participate in our discussion at the conclusion of the presentations. So our goals for this is that we want you to be able to review both classic and contemporary journal articles about this particular topic, understand how our treatment algorithms and understanding of these injuries have changed over time and with all the things that we have learned from the knowledge and work of others, and also identify best practice of how to treat these types of injuries and manage these patients. And then of course, we want everyone to participate and learn as much as you possibly can and get all of your questions answered before you leave here tonight. And there will be a recording of this that is sent out in about 24 hours that'll be available on AO Trauma and also on YouTube. So for anyone that wants to reference this journal club again, or if anyone that is unable to attend today, please feel free to share this with them so they can also share from the knowledge. And for a plug for our next journal club, it's gonna be on December 12th with geriatric peritrochal injury femur fractures. And also all the wonderful resources that are available through the AO, the My AO app, if you have not looked at this, is a wealth of information for both articles as well as cases from participants from across the world. And also the case folio that has a great organization of cases for different topics that is broken down in a very digestible way. So without further ado, we're gonna uh, move on to Dr. Soldier's presentation. Uh, welcome everyone, thank you for joining uh, wherever you are. Uh, for this first uh, presentation, we're gonna be talking about uh, a article by Dr. Alex Hoffman who practices in Mainz, Germany. Unfortunately, Dr. Hoffman could not join us uh, this evening, uh, so I'll be presenting it instead. I have no uh, relevant financial disclosures uh, for you all to share tonight. <clears throat> the objectives for this first uh, presentation is going to be to talk about fragility fractures of the pelvis, and, and I want everyone to recognize why this is worthy of study and is a really unique and distinct en entity from what's uh, typically covered in our discussion of traumatic pelvic injuries, which tends to deviate towards the high energy uh, traumatic injury. And uh, I hope that by the end of this, everyone will recognize this unique population and, and the needs. And in order to do this, this paper that Dr. Hoffman published really helped us with a classification scheme to try to understand the spectrum of instability and common patterns of these injuries. And I hope that by the end of my presentation, you are maybe gain a little further insight and also have an impetus to, uh, to seek further knowledge in this area by reading some of his contributions to the literature. And then finally, you know, once we understand and can classify 
this instability, we want to start to develop uh, common treatment plans for these patients based on the best available evidence. So this is the paper we're going to be uh, that I'll be covering in this presentation by Dr. Rahmans and Dr. Hoffman out of Mainz, Germany. Again, they couldn't join tonight, but they both have contributed quite a bit in this realm. All um, all of these papers uh, reflect their contribution to the literature and the geriatric uh, pelvic injury and why it's uh, unique and different than other patients. And hopefully, uh, these three pre patient presentations I'll I'll come back to at the end will help illustrate that. We have uh, three patient examples I'd like to share with you. The first is a 83-year-old uh, lady with multiple chronic medical comorbidities who sustains no trauma but develops intractable lower back pain uh, that is refractory to uh, evaluation from multiple different uh, people prior to coming to the emergency department. The second patient is a 75-year-old female that just stumbles over some carpet and falls from standing. And then the last is a patient I just treated last week who uh, fell just a one step off a step ladder uh, while change, trying to change a light bulb and sustained a traumatic injury. And so fragility fractures of the pelvis, I think it's important that everyone understand that this is well worthy of uh, further study and is worth your time and to, to really uh, contemplate and understand. And that's because it's unique to patients with some common factors. They generally share advancing age and common comorbid conditions that makes them susceptible to injury and have a final common pathway of either osteoporosis or osteopenia that leads to insufficient bone, either for low energy events or just for normal physiologic loading. Uh, this can be from a falling or just from normal daily activities uh, that they perform. But because uh, of their poor bone quality, they're really uh, different from the typical traumatic pelvic injury. Uh, the graph on the left is my, my way to illustrate that we're used to in trauma, uh, especially in pelvic trauma with the high energy injury, meeting patients at their most unstable or most deformed uh, presentation, often at the, at the moment of impact is the time of maximal instability. But really for these fragility fractures of the pelvic ring, we're meeting them often early in their treatment course when their instability or deformity may be uh, masked or hidden or not yet uh, unveiled, but may develop and uh, advance over time. So we have this golden window to try to recognize and then intervene in these injuries. There's really common uh, predictable patterns, and I, hopefully you'll understand why this leads to this classification scheme that Dr. Rahmans and Dr. Hoffman developed. There are similar patterns of bone loss that every uh, that all of us will experience as we age. Uh, especially uh, prominent is what you see here on the right, these ailer voids that develop sites of localized oste relative osteopenia relative to the surrounding bone that makes them more susceptible in the posterior pelvic ring to fragility fractures in this zone, uh, zone one and zone two region of the sacral ala. So these similar injury patterns develop, again, after really low energy events, either something as simple as a fall or stumble from standing or even just with physiologic loading, similar to what we understand with vertebral compression fractures. And this is becoming more frequent as our population ages and pa patients live longer and expect to be active for longer. Uh, there are common causes of frequently morbidity, uh, painful instability, and can result in immobility. And I think it's worth mentioning that these can be unrecognized or underappreciated injuries on initial presentation by their nature. But our treatment goals are the same for really uh, the majority of the lower extremity, which is to restore the pre-fracture state of stability and allow early patient mobility. And we should do that while trying to limit the morbidity of our treatment. And that means that when we're considering these injuries, we have common treatment pathways such as non-operative care for appropriate injuries, maybe some form of close reduction and uh, internal st stabilization uh, often can be done percutaneously uh, with common techniques. And then for selected patients with uh, presenting deformity or dramatic instability, possibly open reduction and internal fixation. But this is taken directly from Dr. Hoffman's paper and is his classification scheme that I think eloquently demonstrates the, uh, the spectrum of instability that these patients present with. 
uh, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Rommel broke this uh, broke these injuries into four types that they used to describe with type one reflecting slight, type two moderate, type three high, and type four the highest level of instability. And we'll go through each of these. This is directly from Dr. Uh, Hoffman's paper. The type one injury uh, is uh, described as an anterior only injury with no detectable posterior ring injury. Uh, in theory, this should be a stable injury and with adequate pain control, this patient can be mobilized early. Uh, one of the uh, faculty paper, Dr. Scheiman and Dr. Perry will uh, present uh, a, um, a paper that may uh, uh, expand on this um, and uh, which patients need to uh, have sought instability with this supposedly stable injury. Type 2 injury is described as some sort of non-displaced unilateral injury with some varying level of anterior ring injury. Uh, the common treatment pathway for this is based on their clinical presentation with patients with dramatic symptoms of instability or pain may benefit from early surgical fixation and select patients may be able to trial early mobilization and if they have a good clinical response can continue on a non-surgical treatment pathway. The type three instability treatment group is presents with some sort of unilateral displaced posterior injury, either at the level of the sacral ala, the sacroiliac joint, or to the posterior ilium. Uh, often this is associated with an anterior ring injury and depending on the amount of deformity uh, they present with may be appropriate for either closed or open reduction techniques and some form of internal fixation, whether that be percutaneous or through an open approach. And then this final treatment is the uh, often talked about uh, displaced bilateral injury or uh, bilateral posterior ring injury, uh, which is the highest level of instability with some sort of possibly uh, anterior ring injury, although not always for uh, the U-shaped injury. Uh, these patients may be appropriate for closed reduction techniques, and uh, there's been a lot of work on some form of iliolumbar or triangular osteosynthesis fixation. So with these three patient examples, hopefully some of these concepts will be further reinforced. Patient one is an 83-year-old female that presents uh, with no preceding trauma to the emergency department, but she's had really, really severe lower back pain for about three weeks. And you can see on her AP pelvis, even in her lumbar spine, some of the sequelae of prior treatment for lumbar compression fractures. Uh, but she's had multiple ED visits, been evaluated by a neurosurgery and orthopedic spine surgeon in the area with no, uh, no uh, improvement in her symptoms and really pretty dramatic pain. Uh, on first inspection, maybe of her uh, 3D uh, CT, as well as uh, some selected axial cuts, you may have uh, difficulty um, completely identifying her injury other than the sclerosis and some uh, lucency of her uh, in her posterior ring and the uh, zone one region bilaterally, but uh, MRI will uh, reveal the bilateral stress fractures of this uh, U-shaped injury with uh, really no displacement. Uh, bring the uh, the image on the right uh, just to demonstrate, you know, the common uh, presentation of these patients who often have multiple comorbid factors can be challenging to evaluate because of their level of pain, their body habitus, and their multiple uh, potential contributing comorbid conditions. You see her multiple levels of prior instrumented uh, lumbar vertebra. Uh, you see her atherosclerosis, her obesity, and her uh, relative osteopenia throughout her spine. And so uh, that's to say that these patients often require a very high index, uh, index of suspicion when, during your evaluation. But she really responded very nicely to just close reduction and percutaneous uh, screw fixation and uh, really had pretty early uh, improvement of her symptoms. Uh, patient two is a 75-year-old female who stumbles over some carpet and sustains this uh, uh, pelvic ring injury uh, with maybe minimal presenting deformity, you would say, but you know she really is painful in bed. She can't tolerate any turning in bed, uh, has absolutely no desire or interest in mobilizing because of the severity of her pain just while supine on a hospital gurney. And uh, you see here some selected cuts in her 3D CT scan showing that she matches uh, Dr. Hoffman's characteristics of a type 2 
injury with a unilateral uh, displaced sacral fracture with the sacral crush on her left side and an associated anterior ring injury that's length unstable. And so she's treated with a closed reduction again and percutaneous screw fixation of all of her points of instability. The final patient I just treated last week, she uh, fell off a step ladder about a step while changing a light bulb, uh, but she uh, presented, she's on uh, atrial fibrillation for Eliquis, a pretty common uh, condition in this population. So she developed a uh, head bleed that uh, required uh, neurosurgical uh, uh, intervention. And so while she's asleep on the operating room table for this injury that may not necessarily um, suggest uh, a high level of instability, based on her initial amount of deformity or lack thereof. With a stress examination uh, while asleep, you can see uh, the unveiling of her instability um, during her neurosurgery uh, case and uh, using that opportunity to perform a stress examination while she was already asleep. And so uh, she is also treated with a closed reduction percutaneous screw fixation now while she has minimal deformity and uh, can recover and start to mobilize early. And so, you know, my take home messages for everybody is hopefully the first thing is that everybody recognizes that fragility fractures of the pelvis are probably um, under uh, represented or undercovered in the in the literature and in these types of presentations. Uh, there are common injury patterns that are shared with these injuries, and they're really unique from the typical uh, discussion of the pelvic ring injury. Uh, the second thing I hope everybody takes away from this is that Dr. Hoffman and uh, Dr. Rommels uh, contributed a very useful and practical classification screen to help to uh, group some of these common patterns with uh, um, a spectrum of instability to help to guide uh, your early evaluation of these patients and uh, your uh, treatment algorithm. And then the final thing I would say to remind everyone that our treatment goal is to restore the patient's pre-fracture level of stability and mobility, but we should do that while minimizing uh, the uh, morbidity uh, that we confer uh, from that. And so um, in this, you know, very physiologically frail and at-risk population. So thank you all very much. Good evening. My name is uh, Dr. Stephen Chaman. I'm one of the uh, ortho trauma surgeons at Harvard UCLA. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Josh Perry. He's an orthopedic trauma surgeon at Denver Health and an associate professor of orthopedics at University of Colorado, uh, where he's the director of orthopedic trauma research and the director of research and education there. Thank you for joining me, Josh. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate the time. Perfect. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, his paper uh, from the July 2023 issue of JOT, uh, geriatric patients uh, presenting with isolated pubic rami fractures and inability, inability to mobilize may have occult LC pelvic ring injuries with dynamic instability. Um, so, uh, Josh, why don't you kind of just talk about what the impetus uh, for the study and background that led to the um, the study we're talking about today? Of course. Um, you know, funny enough, this was uh, totally just a mistake because, you know, at Denver Health, we get lateral stress radiographs on minimally displaced LC1s. And, you know, sometimes the nighttime resident, not sure if they see anything in the back, just to be safe, they would stress these patients with isolated rami fractures. And I, I remember the day that the very first case of this came in, I was like, why did you stress that? And they showed the stress radiograph and it was positive. And I thought that was very interesting and unexpected. And then we got an MRI that showed a posterior ring injury. And then we just started doing that for about a year. And we identified that over that time frame, we had 19 patients with isolated rami fractures that could not walk uh, in the ED and would require you know, discharge to a facility or require admission. And we got stress radiographs on them and 40% were po uh, positive. And on the MRIs that we got of those patients, all of them had a posterior ring injury. So it was just very interesting. And I think you know, maybe one of the reasons that these injuries can be so um, painful for patients and um, uh, decreasing their ability to mobilize is that they're actually occult LC1s. Excellent. Th thanks. Yeah, super interesting. I guess uh, my question is, I'll, I'll jump kind of, uh, let's see if I can jump to this slide here from the paper. Um, and uh, I think this is kind of a good slide to kind of talk about what maybe describe your protocol and 
kind of how you use lateral stress radiographs to um, find or detect uh, dynamic instability, as well as kind of how you get these x-rays, and, and I guess when, yeah. So this was actually the first patient that I was talking about. So you can see, you know, on the CT there on the left, no visible injury. Um, and then the MRI showing the complete sacral fracture. So at our institution, we're getting lateral stress radiographs in everybody uh, that with a minimally displaced LC1, meaning less than one centimeter. Um, you know, this is prior to this, it was all E-ways in the operating room. And the major issue with that is requires an operating room. It's either going to be positive or negative, and you're going to, you know, burn an OR time essentially if it's negative. So this has been a nice uh, alternative to that. Um, it does cause pain. There's no doubt about it. Patients do not enjoy the lateral stress radiograph, but it's done in the lateral decubitus position and uh, just an AP pelvis taken in that position. And it can be done. We've shown that it, the stress can be positive with the injured side up and down. It doesn't matter. Uh, excellent. And are these uh, x-rays being done just by the radiologist or does it require having residents there to kind of help position the patient and, and kind of uh, assure the quality of the image? No, uh, that's done completely by the radio, uh, the rad techs. And, you know, we luckily, fortunately, we've had one rad tech that's been here a long time and he kind of spearheaded this whole thing when I first came here because the lateral stress radiograph had never been done at Denver Health until I got here out of fellowship. And so he kind of took it upon himself and developed a whole protocol. We subsequently published that this year in the European Journal of Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology, showing that a technique for that. Uh, but, you know, it does require, and that's another benefit of this, it doesn't require any uh, physician assistance. Excellent. So kind of going back to the study uh, at hand, so, um, you know, you noted that uh, looking at kind of your patient cohort, I, I think is about 19 patients, uh, about 42% of them uh, had dynamic instability. And these were these were uh, geriatric uh, women, mostly with unilateral kind of comminuted distal ramus fractures from ground level falls. And those patients with instability, um, they, they, uh, they, they were more likely to be unable to ambulate. I guess my question is, how, how long at your institution are you uh, attempting allowing them to attempt to mobilize and then how do you counsel them thereafter in this setting these are the patients that are in the ed you know we're not admitting them for surgery so the, the physical therapist can either see them and they can't mobilize and they either require admission to the hospital or straight discharge to a rehabilitation facility or nursing home so it's that cohort excellent so if they're basically uh, not able to get up and walk out of the emergency department they're getting a stress radiograph Understood. And since uh, you guys have adopted this protocol at uh, Denver Health, um, what has kind of changed in your practice during that time, or ha has it changed? It hasn't really changed. Uh, we're you know still getting stress radiographs and offering surgical fixation to those who uh, you know are agreeable to it if they're stress positive. You know, we just presented at OTA this year on the complications of fixing these. And, you know, it's not insignificant. We had a 16% complication rate with an 8% uh, reoperation rate. So I think it's really important to counsel patients on this. Um, the, I think the patients who benefit the most are the ones, you know, dynamic instability is a gradient. So a centimeter of displacement can be debilitating. Two centimeters displacement, very debilitating. So those are, the, I think, you know, I counsel patients stronger if they have more dramatic amounts of displacement, you know, the pelvic ring injuries that completely collapse uh, on the stress radiograph. Got it. Excellent. So what um, what takeaways kind of would you give uh, to, you know, the orthopedic trauma community from this study and kind of what what future directions do you think um you know this opens up or what what studies are you are you working on now or would you like to do in the future thank you so i, I think really these injuries shouldn't be written off i think for a long time i think a majority of centers you know isolated rami fracture oh it's, we published on it many times it's very debilitating patients have a lot of pain the mortality rate is 16 percent at 90 days well, maybe they're occult LC1s. So I don't think we should let these patients just go up to the floor or go to the rehab facility and never be seen again by us. 
I think it's important to keep an eye on them as they may be lateral stress uh, or lateral compression type injuries that may benefit from fixation. And then from future research directions, you know, the next study I would like to do is actually use kind of a composite outcome score because uh, obviously in the literature, we haven't really been able to show definitive, I think very strong benefits to surgery. So I would like to look at a composite score, say timed return to baseline, meaning baseline ambulation, baseline housing, and um, you know minimal to moderate pain. I think that would be very interesting and look forward to that. Excellent, thank you. Um, so what um, do you feel that, uh, you know, the, the kind of back, I guess, to lateral stress radiographs, do you feel that there, there's no role at all for um, examination under anesthesia for LC1s? Oh, no, not at all. I think a lot of, there's definitely patients that, you know, spine injuries, patients that are going to the operating room for other injuries that never were able to get a stress radiograph. Uh, we definitely perform EUAs on those. Okay. Uh, but for an isolated LC1 injury or isolated rami fracture that needs an EUA, um, if they can tolerate a lateral stress radiograph, I think that is uh, better for the hospital system and the operating time and utilization. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, for your time, and uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you at the webinar uh, next week. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can look forward to seeing what's coming out of Denver Health in the future uh, with these lateral stress radiographs and those future um, studies you brought up. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, my name is Patrick Kellum. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at UT Houston. And joining us tonight is Dr. Chip Rowe, professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Texas at Houston, and a senior author on one of the papers we'll be discussing entitled, Does Operative Treatment of Geriatric Pelvic Ring Injuries Lead to a Higher Risk of One-Year Mortality, published in Injury in 2021? Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today, Dr. Rowe. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking. Um, you've taught me something about historical context being important in the setting of treating injuries. So I was just wondering if you could take us through how the treatment of geriatric pelvic ring injuries has evolved over the years since you were a resident to uh, where you are now. Well, I think it's still evolving, uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I think you can look at it uh, two ways. One is it's kind of sad that it's still evolving. Uh, but two is it's really good that we've made as much progress as we've had. I, I still think uh, senior patients get ignored uh, a lot, and I think uh, instability of pelvic ring injuries gets uh, underdiagnosed still or delayed in the diagnosis. Um, you know that some of the patients have communication issues uh, and they're not able to necessarily complain. Some of their bone quality issues make it more difficult to identify. Uh, a diagnosis. I think as far as, you know, femoral necks and intertrochs, they get a lot of attention uh, pretty promptly these days, but from a pelvic ring standpoint, uh, unfortunately, it's it's better than it used to be, which is great, but it's still a um, lot, lot of work to do just in diagno diagnosis and, and also uh, giving them a treatment that I think they warrant. Thank you for that. Uh, this paper that we're going to discuss is a retrospective review of 90 patients uh, all over the age of 70 from two level one trauma centers that underwent operative fixation of their pelvic ring injuries. The primary outcome was one year all cause mortality and secondary outcomes included hospital and ICU lengths of stay. Uh, the average age of the patients included was around 80 years old and the majority were female and half had low energy uh, injury mechanisms. Overall, there was about a 9% mortality rate uh, in the cohort at one year, and the average length of stay in the hospital was about nine days. So with regards to this, the methods of the paper, Dr. Rout, the protocol for determining operative intervention was static preoperative images or an exam under anesthesia. Uh, what have you found to be the best way for indicating these elderly patients for operative intervention? Well, probably the best way is just to know what happened to them and then to listen to their complaints. And, um, you, you know, you don't get to be old without being pretty tough. And so most of them aren't going to complain much at all when they have stable pelvic ring injuries. You'll find that most elders, when they have stable injuries, they, they want to get up and get back to doing whatever it was. And so the, 
the best way to make the diagnosis is just listen to them. And the ones that can't be mobilized, they don't want to roll in bed. They don't want you to touch their bed. They don't, they sure don't want you examining them for instability while they're awake. Those are all incredibly good clues uh, as to instability. A lot of times the patients will come in with binders on and the binders will completely reveal the lateral compression and stability. But as you pointed out, a, a, about half of our patients were high energy uh, uh, fractures as well. So these were both level one trauma centers. And so uh, there was a, a, for sure, a lot of low energy mechanisms, but our study is a little bit uh, slanted because it does have a higher percentage of high energy. But there's a lot of different ways. Uh, exam, exam understand anesthesia, a binder film that reveals the displacement, a, a static film that shows it's a C or a, a, a you know an open book injury. There's all kinds of ways to make the diagnosis, but the easiest is just listen to the patient. Yeah, I think your point about uh, half of the patients had some type of higher energy in, uh, mechanism is even more of a strength of the paper showing that operative intervention was helpful, that there was only a 9% mortality and, and half these patients did have a higher energy mechanism. Um, I think that's why a lot of them stayed in the hospital a little bit longer. You know, that length of stay that you talked about, uh, if you really dissect the paper, a lot of that is, you know, from that 50% of high energy, you know, especially with the ICU stays and things like that. For sure. Um, the, what is the role for an exam under anesthesia? And, and I think there's a lot of debate out there of how to interpret what, a, what is a positive exam under anesthesia and what is a negative uh, exam under anesthesia. How do you go about um, determining whether someone needs one and how do you interpret it? I would say someone needs one when they are not making progress, when you think they have a stable injury, but they're not making clinical progress and they can't be mobilized. How, how I do it is just put, a, put them to sleep, which is really good because I think anesthesia these days is so much safer than when I first started. So that's a real benefit. And then we just tilt the C-arm to an inlet view and then put a hand on the iliac crest on both sides and then fire your trapezius or your pectoralis muscles to make a medial displacement and then see on the C-arm what the displacement is. If you're pushing 10 to 20 pounds of pressure and there's not much displacement, and um, you can say that's a negative exam, but if there's displacement with a rebound reduction, then that's, I mean, sometimes a ramus will go all the way over to the contralateral ramus and impact it. So sometimes the instability is really dramatic when the static films don't show very much. So the indications are just people that you think are stable and not making progress or people that you're already gonna operate on, you know they're unstable, you just wanna see the extent of the instability. Perfect. And when you do decide to operate, uh, what techniques have you discovered to help in, uh, for fixation in osteoporotic bone? And uh, so, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you deal with the imaging of um, uh, some of these elders' bone quality is harder to see on fluoroscopy and some tricks you've, you've found to, to help with that? Well, the first trick is to make sure your radiologists know that and your trauma surgeons know that they don't need oral contrast. So that was the early 90s. <clears throat> with early 90s oral contrast CTs used to be a real standard and then as the trauma surgeons got better and the radiologists got better we were able to stop doing that so oral contrast will really hurt you with your imaging the next is to spend a lot of time with the plain films the plain films will reveal to you what you're going to see on the fluoro images in the operating room and so the plain films still have a role and then once you're through with the routine inlet and outlets then go to the axials and the sagittals and the coronals and the surface renderings. The surface renderings can help you a lot with how much tilt you'll need to reveal the exact level of inlet that you want. So it's just it's just all about preoperative planning and not ignoring the plane films. If you can see it on a plane film, you're going to be able to see it in the operating room, typically. And. Um... If there had been a control group to this paper, uh, what do you think the outcomes of those patients would have been compared to the operatively treated group? Well, I, you know, I'm incre incredibly biased, but I, I don't think people with unstable rings do very well, whether they're old or young. <laughs> so I think the control group was pretty much everybody before 1985 or so when we, or 1990, 
when we started operating on these uh, a lot more. And so uh, the control group uh, didn't do very well. We, I think we, we've had generations of control groups. And the, the nice thing for your generation is you don't see a bunch of patients with pelvic mal and non-unions. Unfortunately for me, when I was a resident and a young clinician, uh, you know, in the 80, 80s and 90s, and even into the 2000s, you know, I, I saw patients that had non and malunion as a result of non-operative management for unstable injuries, and it is not a good thing. Especially, it's not good for elders, and it's it's especially not good for youngers. Yeah, and we use one-year mortality as an outcome for a lot of the hip fracture research. Um, what, is that the outcome we should be looking at in studying uh, operative treatment of geriatric pelvic rings, or is there something else that you think matters? Pain control, uh, narcotic usage, being able to mobilize earlier. What what should we be focusing on when we're trying to study this to to further elucidate whether this is helping folks or not? I think you can study all of those things, but probably the the two things that matter is can they get up and get back to their previous functional level without compromise and do they die? And so you can, <clears throat> you can study all those other things, excuse me, but um, probably the, the thing that we thought was the most critical was uh, do they die and when, when do they get back to wherever they're supposed to go? So um, I, I think that's what we're all after. The, the mortality we also chose just because um, you know, that's that's accepted and popular, and there's now reliable ways to find out if people are alive or dead. And so uh, that's why we chose that. You know, we, we use this Charleston comorbidity index, and I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but, you know, uh, if you look it up and sort of go through it, you realize that um, it's, it's rough in the fourth quarter of life. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I did my own yesterday, and, and it, it, the result was not good. And so, you know, I started manipulating the data. Once I, I sort of put in the data, and then I went, oh, geez. And then I started backtracking to manipulate my own. So uh, you might want to stay away from doing your own Charleston yeah. comorbidity index. Yeah, I, I, I don't recommend that. Not interested. Surgeons shouldn't do that. Just do it for the patients, not for yourself. Yeah. Um. And then based on the results of this study, do you think um, folks that are just starting out or early on in their practice should be considering treating more of these pelvic ring injuries in the elderly operatively because of this? Um, and yeah, as, as long as you know the techniques and know, um, you know, one of the things that people when they first start is they're timid about fixation and they're just trying to get a screw in that's safe. And I, I think that's fine, but that's pretty much screw 101 is trying to get the screw in safely. The thing I would tell you for the elders that gives you success so you don't need a bunch of gimmick fixation. You see the market now being flooded with gimmick fixation and you don't need gimmick fixation. You just need long and strong screws and you you need fixation at every available level posteriorly that's, that's strategic and then you need fixation of the anterior and the posterior ring. So you're trying to optimize. There, there are some newer devices that are being you know, made that are, allow us to maybe get into the ramus better and they're a little bigger and things like that. But I, I just think that early clinicians need to be careful about just trying to get in a screw and say, okay, that's good, I got a screw in it. That, that's usually not a single transacral screw for an unstable U or an unstable ring is not gonna be enough for an elder. And so when you see these fixation rates fail in other publications and you look as to why they're having fixation failures and why they're looking to gimmick fixation is they're, they're just relying on a single screw posteriorly or they're not filling all of the available osseous fixation pathways. Elders not only warrant that, it, your success as a surgeon and their result as a, in function relies on that. So it needs to be a long, strong, and fill the pathways. Perfect. So yeah, there's there's a ton of technique that goes into it. it, it we don't have time for all that, but inserting a, a, a transacral screw in an elder, um, much less two or three, um, that's a whole separate topic, but that's what's necessary in order to be successful. Perfect. And lastly, what do you uh, predict to be some key issues that we should address over the next decade in, in this uh, area and realm of, of treatment of elderly pelvic ring injuries? Well, the key issues, um, 
would be the things that we've already talked about that are deficits, and I'll just stick to the, the two we've talked about. One is diagnosis, and that we have to reach out to our emergency room colleagues and do some type of better education for them so that they identify these patients rather than ignore them or miss. I, I don't know if it's an ignoring, but it's it's a missed or a delayed diagnosis. So we, we just don't want the patients having to go to three or four different o, uh, ERs, finally get the proper study, and then three weeks after injury, get referred to, to someone. And then the, the other thing is we as orthopedic surgeons have to educate ourselves to safe techniques to where we can give the patient's injury what it needs rather than what we may know how to do or may not know how to do. So we, we have to optimize ourselves tech, technically so that we can then optimize the surgery for the patient. Yeah. And that and again, that's not just slipping in a single screw and going, I got that screw in, I'm real good. Let's move on to something else. Yeah. Right. So education and then advancing the surgeon's technical abilities. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, Dr. Rout, and uh, we'll get back to the other studies. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that was great. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're going to open up for some questions. I've been monitoring the Q&A. Not a super lively group, but there is one question I want to highlight, and then I got some questions of my own. But so we had a question about uh, DVT chemoprophylaxis in these pelvic ring injuries. What are you doing? I think it's especially pertinent. A lot of these uh, older patients may be on blood thinners for cardiac or head bleeds. How are you balancing that bleeding risk and then the DVT chemoprophylaxis? Yeah, at our hospital, very aggressive with Lovenox. Um, our trauma surgeons want everyone to be getting it all the time to prevent clots. So, I mean, we, we routinely give it pre-op. Um, at part of that complications paper, we presented OTA showing the complication rate. Most common was hematoma. So, you know, maybe that is a result of that. So I think bleeding is a real risk after percutaneous uh, fixation, especially in the elderly population. Um, but we're still giving uh, Lovenox regardless. Even if they're on a blood thinner, you don't consider that a uh, chemoprophylactic if they're on like an well, Aliquis or something like that? They're coming in on something. We would just put them back on that. So it's really more the trauma, trauma patient population that the general surgeons have on their service, I guess, versus our independent isolated L, uh, LC1 or pelvic ring. You don't give it to the patients that have, you know, head bleeds and things like that, Augie, but you just give them the, uh, the uh, medication that they need. Both of my patients today during their surgeries were getting their Lovenox shots in the middle of the surgery. So we, we just give people anticoagulation. Unless unless their head's bleeding or they got a spinal cord injury or something like that. Or I mean a spine injury. Very good. Uh okay. Now we got some questions rolling. So another well, you question told, is, you told them they weren't being very lively, so you've stimulated I'm them. glad I like them to see the response you, is what we're talking about. That's what it's all about. You, you slap them awake. <laughs> All right, so is there ever a time when you think the bone density is too low to be able to use metal fixation? I think this kind of goes back to Dr. Routes kind of closing remarks there about, you know, we are seeing a lot of different things on the, uh, in the market, you know, fusing the SI joint instead of fixing it. Is there, or people I just, I just want to, I, I, I just want to say uh, since 1990 or one ninety one. I've just used screws and not, not screws with holes that have to inject cement, just screws. But you, you can't intrude the washers past the lateral iliac cortical bone. You can't put the heads into the SI joint. You can't do a bad technique and expect the screw to work. And so, you know, it was rough before 2006. In 2006, we got screws that were longer than 130 millimeters. Once we got screws longer than 130 millimeters, the world changed. Uh, before that, we were trying to, you know, put screws together from side to side. So it, it's, um, it, it, we don't need, uh, in my opinion, I haven't needed gimmick stuff yet. There are situations where I, uh, the, there, there are curved implants and things like that being developed now. I like that because I think that will accommodate the pathways but I don't need things and I need to squirt glue and stuff like that. And I, I don't need the interventional radiologist slathering on cement 
percutaneously onto a ramus and saying that's going to make a ramus. Not in, you know, the, I I don't understand all this stuff. I'll, I'll, let you know, I'll let you know when screws don't work. I promise. I will let y'all know when screws don't work. Yeah, six cores in the back. I've never been disappointed, even in the the poorest of bone quality. Um, the in the front, however, retrograde rami screws, distal comminuted fractures, geriatric population. Um, you know, I've had a lot of the screws back out, and you know, it could be definitely unicortical. And we're published on that. The unicortical screws will slide out of these geriatric patients um, in my hands. Um, so I think it's really important to try to get bicortical there. And I haven't had any headless compression retrograde screws slip out yet, uh, but I'm sure it's just a matter of time. I think the other point that Dr. Rout made as well that's important here is to really utilize all the ossification pathways you have available to you. So fixing all the points of instability, getting multiple screws at multiple levels, and treating these patients as a higher energy pattern because their poor bone quality will definitely work in your favor to create a stable fixation construct. Yeah, I agree with that. As many screws as possible. But those parasympathetic ones too have also usually been going anti-grade now because if I can with a cannulated screw end it a little bit lower into a little better bone stock. Where when you go retrograde, I feel like it's forcing you high into sometimes the smaller part of the fracture. No doubt. All right, cool. All right. Another question is for can you provide advice for a community ortho surgeon who sees several of these a year? Which ones do I need to refer from the ER? If they're maybe not comfortable putting in the screws, they haven't had that training. I think you send the ones that you identify to the person that knows how to do the, the fixation of the treatment. And just like you would uh, uh, send to an arthroplasty surgeon or send to a sports surgeon, or, you know, if, if I tear my meniscus, I'd like to have someone knows how to take out a meniscus, whatever, whatever it is you need, I would send it to the person that knows how to do it. Yeah. The pain out of proportion patient, if you see a minimally displaced or pelvic ring, even an isolated rami, but their pain is out of proportion and they're not mobilizing. You know, I would prefer to see that sooner than later. I'd always rather see someone with a stable pelvic ring in my office than see someone four weeks later with a displacement that I can't really correct easily. It's just, it's just uh, easy to see everything early and then sort it out and get it taken care of. But that's just, uh, I don't like messing around with mal and non-unions. Yeah, and I can't emphasize that Dr. Rod's point enough. I think both of those are great points, but if you have any concern, any question, I think any of us in most orthopedic trauma surgeons in your region would be more than happy to take the patient and evaluate them and make a decision. And if that's something that you're not comfortable with or you're unsure about, please reach out to somebody close to you that you trust or you feel like has a skill set to deal with this, and they should be able to help you out. Are people seeing many referred into them at their trauma centers, the geriatric LC ones? Once they're a non-union. Once, yeah, exactly. Those are, as Dr. Rout said, extremely challenging to fix. And, you know, they're usually pretty miserable. So it's usually six months to a year and they've not healed and they're not happy. Is, yeah, so do you I, guys have I, many? I, uh, oh, sorry. Go for it. No, I was going to say, I just picked that a little bit. So I think that this population in general was a little bit undertreated when I first got here. And they the volume has steadily increased every year I've been here. And I don't know, I don't know if that has anything to do with me at all or the place that I work at, just being a tertiary referral center. But they have, I think people have realized over time, either through literature or webinars or whatever educational modality they use that some of these may require more than what was historically done. And I have certainly seen more and more referred every year that I've been here. You know, Augie, when I lived in the Northwest and in the nineties, there weren't a lot of orthopedic surgeons all over Alaska, Montana, Idaho. And so these patients would come and then their local orthopedics, they go back to their hometowns and their local orthopedic surgeons would follow them. And the best <laughs> the best advertisement for the surgery was the patient because they were miserable when they came. And then when they went back, they were comfortable. And so when you're able to follow a patient that someone else has operated on and the patient is really no problem for you, they don't have issues. And because someone shoved a bunch of screws in, all of a sudden that becomes a pretty good referral source because then they identify the patients. They know that they're getting better and they're, they're happy to see them and follow up when they come back to town. So that, that was, uh, you know, it, 
<laughs> that's how things really took off, at least in the Northwest in the 90s. I would nice. say, that, you know, these are real challenging patients to take care of if you don't have these skills. But if you do, they're really pretty straightforward. And so uh, once you open yourself up to them, uh, they tend to find their way to you because you have a solution for patients that really have a pretty intractable, miserable problem in some situations where they've been passed off through people multiple times, uh, trying to seek some sort of uh, option to actually help. And, you know, if you get them early, you can make a big, big difference. And then uh, another question came in for Dr. Rao and Dr. Perry, but really for everybody, are you ever doing any sort of protected or limited wayfaring to these geriatric patients ever in any sort of circumstance? Well, sure. I mean, you you suggested them, but I mean, they're, you'd love to protect your repair, but the problem is, is their shoulders hurt. They can't use walkers very well. And so they usually kind of do the best they can to try to protect if they can understand what you're talking about. But a lot of them can't even understand what you're talking about. And they just start walking, you know? So I, I don't, I don't know how Dr. Perry feels, but uh, they, they usually just kind of do what they want. That's a privilege of maturity. All, all minimally just LC1s that we fix or weight bearing is tolerated for certain. I don't restrict them at all. But when you get to the tile C's, um, uh, vertical shears, stuff that are very unstable with the symphysis diastasis, I'm protecting those. Whether or not they follow those instructions, that's up to them. And it also depends on you know, if they're polytrauma. So if they have multiple injuries, I will, you know, if if it's going to help them get up and move a little better, maybe I'll, it's not a uh, all or none for certain. It's each patient specific at that point. Nice. All right. Uh, and then I kind of talked on this one, ever, but another question about using the actual factory like cement in the screws, kind of similar to how there's fenestrated screws and hip fractures. Anyone with any experience of that? No, 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 I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the things that people get concerned about is the imaging. And it was brought up, I think Dr. Kellum brought up about the tricks and things like that. And we had a really good example yesterday in the operating room of one of the tricks. Sometimes people have a tough time, especially seeing on the outlet imaging, the tunnel exit points of the foramen. And if you look at a lot of the sacra, you'll see a residual disc between the S1 and S2 and sometime between S2 and S3. And just remember those tunnels, you know, half of the tunnel comes just above that disc and the other half comes from the level below. And so those, those holes or those foramen that people are looking for, if you can find the little residual disc in between the one and the two or the two and the three, and then just sort of, sometimes you just roll the, the CR just a little bit to look almost like looking at the nostril of the frame, and then you'll be able to see them better. But pe people are always looking for tricks to be able to see better. And that's a pretty easy thing to do and to know about. And if you have surface renderings then you can go back and forth between the two and all of a sudden these, these things just will pop out. But uh, I, I think that's an important thing to mention as far as just the imaging that didn't get brought up in the, the video. Great, thank you. Um, you know, with geriatric people, there's always concern of anesthesia. Anyone have any experience doing these cases under spinal anesthesia, maybe the percutaneous fixation uh, instead of general? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Was it a good experience? Well, have you done uh, cephalomedullary nails and things like that around uh, with uh, with things like that with blocks? And is, as long as things work and you can sedate them a little bit, it's fine. But if you don't really get that great of a block and then or uh, what and a, a spinal and and they're kind of pawing and kicking, it, or, you know, if people are grabbing at you when you're trying to operate and then they're moving around and squirming on the table to try to get a little more comfortable, uh, it's just a little bit of a problem. So I would. I would really strongly uh, um, emphasize a, a uh, general anesthetic. Like Josh said, at our institution, the general surgeons are uh, quick to go down to the emergency department, it seems like, and give patients Lovenox down there. So most of them don't even, uh, aren't even a candidate for a spinal before they get to the operating room. So if you are interested in trying to do that, it's uh, making sure your hospital system is set up to do um, uh to not give anticoagulation before they get to the operating room. 
Very good. Uh, and one more question about this was about using infix at all, maybe for the anterior ring. You kind of talked about maybe curremi or <laughs> maybe comminution or something. Much with infix or maybe just xfix in general in this population. No experience. I have found in the LC1 population X fixes, those patients don't seem to benefit from surgery as much. There's, you know, they're still an intractable pain, wheelchair bound. So I, I try to avoid X fixes at all possible costs. And I just don't necessarily like infix because it results in another surgery and I has some complications associated with it. Did a lot in fellowship, but I currently do all ray my screws, and you can get a ray my screw in pretty much everybody. Yeah, I have an extremely biased opinion about this from where I train in Dr. Rath's mentorship. And I it's just not something I've needed. And I'm very aggressive with anterior ring fixation as a result of everything that I've learned. And so I don't do it either. Is everyone fixing anterior the anterior ring here in geriatric pelvic ring, or is there cases where just the back? I fix everything I can. I mean, a lot of times the parasympathetic bone is crumbs. I think you were referring to that earlier, or it's just so comminuted, it's not going to hold a screw. And so we don't. And if you need to plate that, if you load up the back and it's still unstable, then you have to open and, and plate it or use a frame. But frames either in or out, frames aren't very durable in elders. Dr. Rowe, can you touch base on when you said uh, if it's still unstable, uh, are you stressing that? you put screws in the back and you notice that there's parasympathetic comminution that you don't think you can get a screw in, and then you're going to stress them to see. Correct. You want to make sure that what you did in the back did what you thought it was going to do. A lot of times the patients will fool you. You know, Dr. Perry has just told you about a paper they wrote where, you know, they, they found things that they didn't think they were going to find. And that's the same thing. If you don't examine them after you stabilize the posterior ring and you don't, you can't do the front, you'll, you'll never know. The only way you know things is to look, to look. It takes two, less than a minute. Nice. I wonder, you know, we talked a lot about the dynamic instability and instability being correlated with pain, which I think we're all in agreement with. But uh, what, how about this idea of maybe people who have a stable pelvic ring but still have pain? Much experience with that where they maybe just, needed extra fixation to help them get going? In our series, since I've been at Denver Health for five years, I think there's three patients that had less than a centimeter displacement that were just, you know, I don't know if it was a pain, it was just their pain tolerance or whatnot, but we did fix them for uh, pain and inability to mobilize and they all got better and started mobilizing after surgery. So you know, they were between five and eight. Maybe that's a messed up measurements. Maybe the x-rays were bad, but I, there are some patients there. And that just get, comes down to back to, do we even need stresses at all? Should we just go on base and, based on patients' inability or pain out of proportion uh, to mobilize? So I don't know. Still lots of questions. Yeah, Augie, I don't know if we know that answer uh, scientifically, but I, I think there are patients that, uh, just don't mobilize and, and then they seem to get better with fixation. And, uh, again, there's no evidence or, or data. I can say that they're walking better, but they, they do subjectively feel better. So there's something about them, the instability of the ring that the, their body senses. All you have, to do, all you have to do is talk to them and listen to them. They'll, they'll tell you when they're unstable. I mean, unless they're not sane or not, they're so demented they can't express themselves, but you know, if, if they, if they're not demented and awake and alert, they, they'll let you know. The other thing I'd say is the role of an MRI in this population. You know, that first patient I showed in my presentation, you know, had no, probably no detectable instability, uh, certainly not with the plain foam radiographs, really just had bilateral, you'd say stress fractures that uh, were unveiled with an MRI and had the intractable pain and uh, symptoms and that you're talking about everybody's sort of describing here and i think everybody's seen some version of this patient before and so you listen to the patient you uh, evaluate them you take them seriously and then the mri does have a role for the people that maybe don't have a detectable injury uh with either you know there's no dynamic instability with some of these patients like dr perry's talking about but mri will still show that there is something happening that uh, uh that needs to need stability 
So we, we stopped getting MRIs, interestingly, after you know this whole this paper came out, because I thought it was just kind of an overuse of this system. However, one of those patients in this study that got an MRI and had a positive stress, they actually had an LC2. Um, you know, but you know, for that was still captured by a transacral screw, but it's just kind of interesting. So I think in a rare case, you may think you know where the fracture is, but maybe you don't know where the fracture is. And that's when, you know, maybe we should get MRIs on those. But yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Is that what you're using the MRI for? Is to find the where the best fixation is? But like you said, transiliac transacral screw is probably gonna catch most probably. of it. But so that's what we getting an MRI here is like pulling teeth. If we don't have the uh, the the femoral neck fast track MRI system here, it takes days. <laughs> one of my best I friends. Think, uh, one of my best friends in high school, growing up, is in charge of all of our MRI for our entire system. So we we have good good uh, good access. Helps. It's good to have friends, Doctor Ralph. He's a facilitator. <laughs> we've been friends since third grade dr perry i was going to ask you have any other institutions been able to do the lateral stress radiographs um like you guys have at denver yeah no, o ota i had uh, multiple multiple people say they were doing them uh, one one of our local surgeons who is a trauma surgeon works at a different hospital told me a, went out to lunch with him at ota and had he told me a story of a lady that uh, came in and was absolutely miserable and he did the lateral stress and it was positive and he fixed it. But once again, do we need stresses? Cause she was miserable. She just, she just fixed it. Um, so I, it's, I think it's kind of a gray area, but that's, that was nice to hear that, uh, in, that, that I think in the end, whether or not what you're doing, I think treating people who have disabilitating pelvic pain that helps is a good thing. In residency, we did uh, examinations not under anesthesia in the emergency department. We would do uh, what you would do with stress of pelvis in an EUA in the uh, emergency department and take inlet and outlets. Um, so that was another way that we did it uh, instead of lateral stress. So I think there's a couple ways you can examine patients in the uh, before they get to the operating room. Um, but like Dr. Rout kind of says that I think these examinations are also helpful for you to learn kind of the the instability patterns and how these uh, fractures uh, displace. Um, so some of the UAs are, while they are miserable, uh, it's kind of educational for us as surgeons. And is there anything uh, else that either Dr. Scheiman or Zuls or anyone else that has spoken about this a little bit, that they're doing different institutions that they have seen different to diagnose this instability. We've talked about physical examination, listen to patient ability to mobilize, lateral stress radiographs. Is there anything different anyone else is doing? I, I wouldn't say at my institution we're doing anything different. Um, you know, we're mostly uh, inability to mobilize, examining the patient. Um, I would say the, the most difficult patients I have, which I tend to get more frequently, are the demented patients who've gone from not walking, from walking to not walking that are extremely difficult to examine uh, with kind of benign-ish radiographs. Um, and then you're just having kind of a complicated conversation with their family, but nothing special here. I think my Yeah, main... nothing. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, finish it up. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to just say that. Yeah, nothing special. I think just one key point that has been important is not letting these people just go to the floor and forgetting about them. Say, you, we don't do stress exams in the ER at all. I don't think it's a bad idea, but we kind of give these people a trial and listen to them. If they're having a lot of pain, they kind of go to the OR sooner. It feels like maybe they can walk. We'll give them a trial, of, you know, now for management. But it's being in constant communication with the physical therapist, making sure the physical therapist is going there, actually trying to get these people out of bed, actually trying to roll them, actually trying to get them up and walk. Because a lot of times, otherwise, these people will just be on the floor languishing, no one's seeing them. And then seven days later, it's like the patient has immobilized. Sometimes they're refusing surgery. You know, they, there's also the patient, then they don't want a surgery and they think they'll be okay. And then five days later, they can't get out of bed. And then you fix them and they go home the next day. And it's like, ah, I'm sorry, that was really stupid. It's like, well, whatever. I mean, you know, I mean, you had to come to the conclusion, but if if you're refusing, you're refusing. But it's like, I mean, if your pain is eight out of 10 and you don't, I mean, come on. Anyway, it just, uh, you, you got to let them, you know, you, you got to wait a little bit sometimes because, some, you know, patient's always right. That's an excellent point. And it makes me kind of miss the black and white 
days of EUA. Like we got like your LCO and we're taking you. We're gonna stress. We're gonna fix you because there was no. It wasn't a, as much as of a conversation as it was as in my current practice. And now we like for instance one of those patients that had no no visible injury in the back, just an isolated rain, my fracture, healthy, eighty five year old up on a ladder. Uh, he, you know, we had the conversation. You may, you may not been, you, you know, it's controversial. You can, we can fix you. We can not fix you. He adamant against surgery hospital day seven. He finally relented. He had never gotten out of bed. He ended up dying of pneumonia, uh, the next week. So he laid in bed and died. And cause there's a lot of patients. If you say they don't need surgery, they will hold on to that. I mean, it's part of our, you know, as good doctors, we have to have that informed consent process with people, but it also can can be a detracting because like we don't have that conversation with intertropes, right? We don't say, well, you know, there's you, this will heal, but we know we just say, well, you need surgery and we take them and nobody refuses or very few patients refuse the femoral neck or intertroke, but I don't know if it should be like that. Close management kills people. And I just think people lose sight of that. And you just decided one of many examples. Um, I mean, it, it even goes as far as just aspirating because the nurses think they can't elevate the head of bed. I mean, there, there's all types of things that can, that can go wrong. And those patients go with us throughout our career. You know, I haven't forgotten a one. Yeah, I think that's a great point to also engage your ancillary staff at your hospital. So the physical therapist can be an incredible resource for information for these types of patients. I had the good fortune that one of my senior residents when I started his now wife was one of the physical therapists on our orthopedics ward here. And as soon as she understood what I was looking for and what I was trying to figure out, my epic inbox filled up with messages, but that was a good thing. I wanted to know about these patients and how they were doing. And it was much easier to identify the patients that were struggling and those that were making progress with direct communication with the therapist and then also the nurses on the floor. All right, great. I think we just have five minutes left. But uh, you know they're pressing questions or issues. Want to appreciate everyone for coming out. Thank you, of course, to Dr. Rao and Dr. Perry for uh, your informative articles and taking time to answer all these questions. Thanks to all the moderators, Dr. Zolder, Dr. Simon, and Dr. Kellum for uh, being involved and getting these interviews done as well. Thank you very much. And on the behalf of AO, I am um, speaking as the president of AO. Thank you all for uh, doing this. I think these are great things and I appreciate all the work that the volunteer faculty do. So, and thank you to the participants for joining. Yep. And thank you for Mackenzie and April who helped organize this and all the technical aspects of this. Thank you so much. This is all very smooth and we all appreciate your help.